So um, thanks again for joining us in today's session of Founder Stories. Um, my name is Anita Beckham and I'm the head of events at Tankstream Labs. So for those who are joining us for the first time and who aren't familiar with Tankstream Labs, we are a co-working space for tech startups with a global focus. We currently have three offices across Australia, two in Sydney, one in Perth. So we're, we're actually joining you're actually watching us um, direct from our York Street office um, here in Sydney, which uh, Paul is also a member of as well. So we started back in 2012 when Tim Fung and his friends uh, wanted a co-working space or wanted a space for him and his friends to work out of. And that's how Tankstream Labs was created. And we exist to support the growth and innovation of the startup ecosystem. Now, today's session, Founder Stories is basically a fireside chat between myself and a Tankstream Labs founder about their journey and their journey to date, how they got to where they are, um, especially for those who are watching and wanting to start their own business. It's a good session to join us on to see the stories um, of our founders as well. So today's session will run for approximately half an hour. Questions are encouraged. So in your Zoom app there, you'll be able to see a Q&A box. If you have any questions, pop it in there and I'll be able to ask Paul um, for you today as well. So now our founder today is Paul Goday. Yes, um, co-founder and CEO of Metric. Paul, thanks again for joining us. I know how much I love the camera, so really appreciate you being sure. here and go easy on him today, guys. Um, so first of all, let's just start off about telling, you, telling us about yourself. So your elevator pitch. Uh, yeah, so um, my name is Paul, I'm from France. Um, I've been in Australia for about two years. Before that, I was in London for a few years and before that, San Francisco. Um, I'm actually a software engineer, but I never did uh, any kind of engineering work. I went into marketing very quickly. Uh, and recently this year, uh, through the Antler program, I started Metric with two other uh, founders. And Metric is a product to uh, effectively manage all your meeting notes and actions. Yeah, amazing. So before we get into Metric and how your journey started off at Antler, we'll go through that later. But I just want to start from the very beginning. You said you had you were a software engineer, but then you, yeah. you changed dramatically to marketing. It's very yeah. different fields. How did you, what made you change and how did you come about that? that change yeah so when i was 17 18 i didn't really know what i wanted to do but i liked computers mm -hmm. and video games so i thought software engineer <laughs> must course. be a calling yeah so i did it for four five years i did it for five years um it was super interesting but um i just didn't like uh, the idea of like coding all day and working on my own i wanted to work with people mm -hmm. um I didn't know at the time that there is plenty of engineering roles where you do just that, which is great. Uh, but at the time I didn't know much. So I thought it would be good to kind of move maybe more into digital and digital marketing, which was up and coming like 10 years ago. Right. Um, so I joined a small advertising agencies. We were developing their digital arm and they hired me to kind of take care of that. Yeah. Um, so out of luck, pretty much, I very quickly moved from being a software engineer to start working into marketing. Wow, fantastic. And did you have any qualifications or anything in marketing? You just sort of fell into that role? No, well? no qualification at all. It was more like, uh, I mean, the ad agency in San Francisco didn't know anything about it. They just knew it was online stuff. Yeah. Uh, so they thought that someone who studies software engineer would probably sort it yeah, out. Just, yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's it. And how did it go? Did you sort it out? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. we sorted out just fine. Like um, on the back of that, another company hired me to do the same thing. They sponsored my visa in the US mm -hmm. and I never kind of, you know, got out of marketing ever since. Right. Okay. And do you still play in software engineering now or is that sort of a bit in your mm, past? No, not really. Like with Metric, like I help like a tiny bit yeah. on the front end. Yep. Um, but that's pretty much it. Yeah, awesome. So do you want to just explain that a little bit about what Metric does, a little bit more about what yeah. Metric does and how that came about, just so people understand exactly what it is? Yeah, so Metric is, um, has been built to answer a basic need, which is there's no real, um, any real tool or solutions out there to effectively manage and write meeting notes. Like, for example, a lot of people use today Google Docs to write your meeting notes or their personal notepads or you know even their physical notepads, but that's very, those tools are not made to be easily shared and tracked mm -hmm. when there are decisions and actions coming out of them. So Metric was built to solve exactly that problem where it's a 
product where you can very easily link your calendar. So we see all your events in your calendar, and then you can write notes and actions against each of these events in your calendar. The benefit of it is if you assign an action to someone in the meeting, we'll take care of all the admin. So chasing the people, just making sure everything gets done before the next meeting. Awesome. That definitely sounds like a tool that a lot of people can use, especially now when we're all working remotely, right? Yeah. Everything is now done digital and everything is all online. So we'll definitely get into the intricacies of Matrix and how that came about a bit later on in the talk. Um, but I, what I want to, what I would like to understand is how you first started working with startups. Yeah. So you went from software engineering, then you went into marketing, you just fell into marketing. How did you start working for startups? How did you get into that industry? Um, it was very organic path. I, um, my first startup was um, a few years in San Francisco. I was hired by a startup, like a very typical Silicon Valley startup, even mm -hmm. though they were already pretty big. They were 150 people, but they were still considered themselves very kind of startup -y. Wow, um, 150 people. Yeah, yeah. It's just in, in Silicon Valley, you'll find, and I think now everywhere in the world, you'll find a lot of companies there three, four years old, they got a hundred staff, but they still consider themselves startup yeah. in a way. Um, because there's a very positive aspect about yeah. being called that. Do you think it's also you attract the right people? Like we have the yeah. startup culture, so, you know, everything moves really fast and we just get shit done? Is yeah, because okay. yeah, yep. like there's not much, there's not a defined word between startup and big company slash corporates. There's mm. no kind of middle layer. Mm -hmm. So as long as possible, company call themselves startup. So, you know, okay. they got that positive yep. connotation about it. Okay. So I, I joined this um, startup um, in San Francisco yep. after a few years of going there. And that was kind of my first exposure to, uh, to the startup world. And then I joined more when I was in London. So do you think you started working for a startup in San Fran? You thought, right, this is where I wanted, you always want to work in startups now? Or do you think you could actually go back to work in corporate land? Uh, so I've never worked in corporate. Uh, the biggest company I work with is maybe 300 people. Um, Still quite big. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't think I'll ever want to work for a big company because yeah. I think past a certain size, it's very hard to kind of see the impact you have. Yeah, um, agreed. And I just never really like um, being kind of a, you know, a, a tiny wheel in a big engine. Yeah. Um, so I don't think I'll ever kind of go work for a very, very big company. Yeah, interesting. And I think that's, it's funny because when you have conversations with not just startup founders, but people who work in startups, like myself, for example, I can't see myself going to work for any larger companies for this exact same reason. You want yeah. to see the impact. I think that's why a lot of people and those who are watching now, especially want to, you know, want to work in startup world yeah. and why we do, although we do, yes, we do have positive connotations. There's also some, you know, some negatives there as well, but we won't talk about that today. <laughs> um, so you said you worked around uh, across various cities around the world. So for example, you said Paris, San Fran and London. How do you just jump from, you know, one city to another? How does it work? Did you have opportunities that you came across or did you just go over and went, right, I'm going to this city and I'm going to try and get a job? Yeah, it was uh, the second one. It was always kind of, like, I think, like, there's just, it's so easy nowadays, better than ever, to move from one place to another and find, like, a job pretty mm. easily. If you have, if you have like, a university degree, you'd always find a job in big cities. Um, so it's actually easier than it sounds to just quit what you have, move to a new city, and find something there. So for me, the logic was, after a few years in one city, I kind of got you know, the, the great experience out of it, but I think I would get more out of a new experience going to a new city or a new place versus staying where I am. Mm. So I think, yeah, after four or five years, I always tend to kind of move to a new place yeah. and try something different. So I moved from Paris to London, London to San Francisco. Then I went back to London and then I moved to Sydney. And for each of those, I didn't have any, any uh, work or anything planned waiting for me. It was more like, the city sounds really good. The country yeah. sounds really good. Let's go check it out. Yeah. And so you just managed to secure opportunities when once you actually come into the city. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did you have networks or anything prior or you just got lucky a lot of the times with mm, your roles? No, just like no network, but I think like you can force your luck a little bit where like when I came to Sydney, I didn't know anyone, but I used my network in London to get intros to some people here. And then like you can get a lot of those intros yourself by just reaching out to the right people and say, hey, I'm Paul, this is what I'm doing. I just moved here. Yeah. We'd love to have a chat. Yeah. So I think 
there's definitely a big element of luck, but you can force your luck to an extent. Awesome, cool. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about your foray into founder land. So I thought Matrix was your first um, startup, but it's not. So let's talk about your first startup first, um, Urban Hideout, you said it was. Yeah. Want to just give a bit of background on what that is, how that started and that journey? Yeah, so um, a about three years ago, I read um, the Team Ferris book, The 4-Hour Workweek, where it talks yes. about you know, how you can basically be the side hustle um, just working four hours a week. Yep. Uh, and I was very curious about the entire concept and I was, I was thinking, well, you know, let's just put the theory to the test and see if that's actually possible. Mm -hmm. So at the time I was in London and the industry I was in spending a lot of time in was e-commerce. So I knew quite a bit about e-commerce back then. Um, so I thought, let's I already had a full-time job. Let's see if I can keep four hours on the weekend, every weekend and start potentially building a new e-commerce brand out of just myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that. Um, and uh, I started designing a few products here and there. There was, um, I had a passion for just like office space and office accessories. So I was like, I'll just start designing office accessories and see, see how that goes. And the idea was just to kind of design things that are just very, very visually simple and sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so I produced a few, built a few and um, eventually kind of grew this business to um, a six-figure business, um, but in a very kind of bootstrap way. Mm. So it was no investment, no employees. It was just me. Just you, yeah. And then... And four hours a week? Four or? hours a week. Really? For three years, yeah. And now it's... Okay. Now it's... It yeah, has about seven or eight products live. Um, it's doing, yeah, about six figures of revenue. And uh, That's great. when I started Metric at the beginning of this year, I wanted to kind of be fully focused on that. So I, mm -hmm. I basically gave this four-hour week work to my partner mm -hmm. slash girlfriend, who's now kind of taking care of it. Yeah. Wow. So did you, were you actually able to maintain the four hour week principle when you were running urban? Because, you know, a lot of times you, you do a side hustle and you say, okay, I'm only going to dedicate four hours to this. And a lot of the time it's more than four hours. Well, when I was in London, I literally couldn't dedicate more because I had a full time job. Yeah. Um, so I literally so just had the weekend. <laughs> I literally just had the weekend. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, yeah, it was pretty much exactly that, like yeah. just a morning on the weekend, like the yeah. Saturday morning or Sunday morning. Well, and you were still able to build it to a six-figure business. Yeah, no, it's been pretty good so far. Fantastic. Okay, well, that's one successful startup. Now you're on to your second one now. Yeah. So your second startup, so Metric, is you um, founded co-founded this um, yeah. startup with another two co-founders through the Antler cohort. Do you yeah. just want to explain a little bit first, what is Antler and how you actually got involved? And then second, just the process on the whole process on how you actually, you know, started Metric, met your founders, actually created the product and the service and go from yeah. there. So Antler is um, effectively a program where um, individual people like one of the entrepreneurs can apply to. Mm -hmm. um, and if Antler accepts you into their program, you go for kind of a two and a half months program where they put you all together with all these other people that have applied and been accepted. So, you know, in my core, there was about 80 people. Mm -hmm. And during those two and a half months, the whole point is to find one or two or three other founders that you want to start a business with and you have a business idea you want to start. Um, so at the end of the three months, if you found a team, whether it's two people or three people or more, and if you have a solid business ID, you pitch it to Antler and Antler selects a few of the team to receive investments. Um, so through the program, I met Jonathan and Steve, my other two co-founders, um, and we, we kind of knew each other from the beginning of the program, but we really started to kind of work together around the middle. So around that kind of maybe six weeks mark. Mm -hmm. um, we worked on a few ideas and then it was kind of the intersection of a few spaces that we enjoyed quite a bit. So it was collaboration, future of work, um, productivity that kind of led us to look at the meeting space specifically. So okay. the meeting productivity space. Right. Um, and we thought that there was an opportunity in that space and we, uh, we spent a few weeks on that, pitched it to Antler and yeah, got the good news that we're one of the team to get investment. Amazing. And not only you got investment, but you launched during a pandemic as well. Um, yeah. But I guess your product is one of the ones where you, you actually are thriving um, during, because as, as we spoke about earlier, everything's moving to the digital world. Everything's all online now. So I guess that sort of helps. So have you seen that 
even though you launch your in pandemic, you're still, you know, getting traction and there's, and it's going to be even bigger down the track. Yeah, definitely. And I think like, if it wasn't a COVID-19 years, probably we wouldn't have had the traction or the investment we receive from some people. Mm. Um, so for that, it's been a positive for us. Right. Um, if we had the opportunity to potentially start, you know, six months earlier, mm. by the time COVID-19 started, we would have had a product ready uh, that we could give to people. But when COVID started, it was right at the time when we started ourselves. We didn't have any product yet. Yeah. So even though we're still surfing on that wave, mm. um, it would have been good to kind of start six months earlier. Yeah. So when you did eventually start yeah. as well, what were your worries? Like what was going through your head that time, especially when you're launching during the pandemic, you're only just starting to work with your, your co-founders as well. There must have been some sort of like, oh my God, is this going to work? What are we doing? Am I doing the right thing? Like tell us about what you were thinking during that time. Yeah, well, um, the there wasn't any worry. It was more like, you know, it was an amazing experience. We we're starting our own company. We're making the decisions ourselves. Um, we're working like in area and a product we're all excited about. Um, the 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 main worry maybe was just the fact that because of the three of us we didn't really know each other that well. Mm. Uh, we just had a few weeks of working together. Mm. Um, it could have been a challenge to work fully remotely and uh, and not you know the communication may be harder when you work with people remotely and you don't know them really well yeah um and you make you, you talk often you make a lot of big decisions you also have to be very clear on who's making decision yeah. and for what so it forces you to be to be better communicators yeah right? exactly mm -hmm. so we had to be very clear and and quite structured in how we communicate with each other so that we don't have any founder fallout during that remote part yeah Great. And so far, so good. So far, so good. <laughs> so that's with Matrix. So I guess I want to also ask about her Urban Hideout. You also, like during the pandemic, I mean, yes, you have handed the reins over to your partner, but I'm sure there must have been a part of you also worried about, you know, the, the survival of your other company, the other startup too. What did you do there to help manage and navigate um, Urban Hideout to, through the pandemic? Uh, it actually it actually did really good well during the pandemic because because the brand sells office accessories, but a lot of those office accessories are actually accessories you can use at your home. Mm -hmm. A lot of people end up buying them because they're setting an office at their home. So right. it was actually a very good few months for the e-commerce brand as well. Yeah, right. uh, so not very very little worries out of the two <laughs> these last few months. Except for that, you actually both are growing um, yeah. during a pandemic. So you have to go, okay, well, we're growing now. So what are we going to do to manage this growth? Yeah. Amazing. Um, that's, a, that's a good news story to come out of the pandemic, which is good. Would you launch again during pandemic or during a global economic crisis? Um, I think like... We know, for example, some of the teams in the intercourse, like the pandemic was not a good year for them to launch. Mm. It definitely makes things harder. So would they have not done it if they knew? Like, I'm not sure. I think they still would have gone for it. So like, I, I don't think I would necessarily not do something because suddenly the year is a bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it would have to be case by case. Yeah. The, the good news, what I think is good about those those you know, those kind of unique years like this year is a lot of things are changing. And mm. because a lot of things are changing, that creates a lot of opportunity to help with the change of those things and help right, potentially yep. redefine things. So for example, in our space, um, we see that companies are working remotely much more and having meetings remotely much more. So this is the opportunity for us to help them redefine what a good meeting looks like and mm. what a good remote meeting looks like. Mm. Awesome. That's great. And do you think, um, so you worked across different startup indus industries across the globe. Do you think that gave you an advantage of founding your business now? Um, like, for example, your experience in London or San Fran to, to building Matrix here. Do you think you have some sort of advantage there or you think, you know, you would have done it anyway? No, I think no, I think I would have done it anyway. Yeah. I think it was just more of a like the just a, a sum of things that you know ended up being right place, right time, mm -hmm. right. So I, I met 
the right co-founders, we had the right ID, and for some reason it was kind of the right year. Mm. Um, everything kind of fall into places mm. the right way. So, yeah. Yeah, and do you think like the difference, say for example, the working culture in San Fran or the working culture in London or Paris, um, do you think you might have taken you know, some attributes, some good attributes from different companies that you worked with over there and maybe trying to instill it here in the company here or even with Urban Hideout? Um, well, the like English speaking countries working style like UK, Australia, US are quite actually quite similar mm -hmm. um, compared to like France. So in France, the working style is a little bit different. Um, like for example, people are much more direct, much yeah. more straightforward. And if you do that in the UK, sometimes it can appear like rude. Um, right, so like I know for me, I'm much more um, uh, polished around the edges <laughs> when talking to people. Yeah versus you know six seven years ago when i was more used to kind of the french working style That's and i still have a lot of work to do but yeah uh, yeah it's 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 more around yeah more compared to france yeah, wow, that's interesting. And love, it's going to sound really basic, but there's a new show on Netflix called Emily in Paris yeah, that yeah, yeah, fo focuses on the French working culture. And yeah. so what you say is like you see that and you say, you know, they say that French may be a little bit more lax, um, whereas in Australia or in America, let's say, they're very just full on and they're just, you know, working almost 24 hours a day. So yeah and and yeah on that one so my girlfriend watches it and she she says like all the stereotypes are, are way too intense <laughs> like they take the stereotype and put it to the next level it's not as yeah, bad yeah <laughs> um but it's true like in france like you know it's about we uh we we work to live we don't Not live to, to work, work for yes. example. yeah yeah it's amazing and i guess i mean you've worked in different cities and within different startups in different cities so i could imagine the different cultures that you would have experience as well so interesting um and so if we talk about the tech scene in australia versus the tech scene in silicon valley and in europe because you worked across all of them yeah how what differences have you seen or you know even in the levels of maturity well the the australian market is much smaller and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm no expert that's mainly from like the last six eight months of, of being exposed to it but mm -hmm. um the australian market being much smaller you have the exact same a similar impact on you know talent and funding and mm -hmm. um, experts in their field uh, compared to if you go to the UK or if you go to the US you have much more of that mm -hmm. um, I think also like in terms of um, things like startup investment um, there are comp there are funds and companies we talk to in the US like their way of thinking and their their approach to things and to startup, we don't really see that just yet in Australia. So okay. I think like it's possible also the Australian tech ecosystem is a little bit behind mm -hmm. like the US and the UK. Um, but yeah, things are catching up pretty quickly. Do you say that in terms of the amount of investment that um, VCs are willing to invest or the amount of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, involvement they have? Or what, what do you mean like when you say that we're just a little bit behind, in what sense? Uh, I think like around like around their, their way of assessing startups oh. and um, like business model or startups. So for example, there are business model of startup that are much more, um, that didn't exist a few years back, mm. but suddenly they became much more popular. They're kind of new. And in right. the US, they're very popular business model, but in Australia, not so much. Not many companies in Australia, not many startups in Australia have been successful using that business model. And because of that, um, it's hard to value that business model in Australia, right. not having seen the success of it, right. because it's still a bit young. Yeah, right, got you. Um, and I mean, people who I've spoken to in regards to comparing the tech scene to um, Silicon Valley, they all have the same you know, consensus that we are um, early stage, we're not as mature. Um, so there's very, very big differences in the ways that our startups get evaluated and um, the ways that VCs actually you know, um, work with our startups too. Do you think that's the same in the UK as well? Or do you think UK is sort of in middle ground between Australia and Silicon Valley? Uh, I think yeah, middle ground. Yeah. I reckon. Cool. So what do you have planned for the future for Metric? We've got about a couple of minutes left. So I've just got a couple more questions for you. Um, well, we, 
our product is kind of global from day one. We already have users from all over, which is exciting. Right. Um, the plan for us is to definitely grow as fast as possible. Um, the product, the users, and the and the team. We actually just hired our first two engineers, which Woo-hoo! is exciting. Um, <laughs> Are they here in Australia or? Yeah, they're in Australia. Yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, the plan is to look at um, the U.S. market and potentially raise funds there next year. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, just be a very large, you know, startup, company and startup <laughs> in, uh, within the next two, three years. Amazing. So you're looking at branching out to the U.S. So that's going to be yeah. definitely a challenge uh, for you guys. But hey, it's the right time for it now, right? Yeah. Awesome. And if you could change one thing on your journey, what would that be, if anything? Um, I don't have too many regrets because like whatever happened made, made got me you here, right? got, you, got, got me here and I'm pretty happy with where I am. But uh, no, I think like um, when I was I, when I was 17, I wanted to be a, like a fighter pilot, but I <laughs> never I actually never took the test to really go through it. Uh, so that's maybe my only regret. Actually, yeah. at least doing the test so that way you don't you, even if you fail, you have no regret. You try. You try. Like yeah. the worst is not try. Yeah. Great. And on that note, my last question to you, we've got, yep, right on time. Um, what last words of, of advice would you give to those who are watching now or those who be watching recording later? You did say, you know, um, you don't want to have any regrets in life, which is great. And like you want to try. So do you have any other last words or any advice for those who are looking at starting their own business, especially during in a pandemic? What would you say to them? Um, yeah, that, it's not that hard to actually start something. <laughs> like I think for, for first time- So blase, but it's not that hard, guys. <laughs> no, it's, it's to start, to make it successful, I think it's hard, but to actually start, it's actually not that hard. And a lot of people have a lot of difficulties passing that first step Just of actually start. starting. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's not that hard. Yeah, so it's not that hard, guys. You just need to start. And it's true. We hear that a lot from a lot of our founders, especially in our community as well, is that the hardest step is the first step. And you just got to keep, and you, like Paul said, you got to try, right? Because if you fail, well, at least you know you tried. So maybe you should do that test and see if you actually will pass it now. Yeah. Um, good. So now we've come to the end of our Founder Story session. If you do want to watch this session or any other sessions that we've held previously, um, go to our website at tankstreamlabs.com. It's all listed there and also on our YouTube channel at Tankstream Labs. So again, thanks for joining us today in today's Founder Story session. We will see you at the next one. Thanks, Paul, for joining me today. It was a good conversation. Thank you. Thanks. See you later. Bye.